Various depictions of the LGBT plus community have been prevalent in film history for over a hundred years. It's a long, complex, and extremely coded history. In this episode, I want to show you three extremely queer pieces of cinema that somehow made it past the rigid censorship and prejudice of early Hollywood. Just a quick reminder to hit the like and subscribe button so my team and I can continue delivering more videos. The Motion Picture Association didn't start rating films G, PG, PG-13, and so on until 1968. However, the association itself was formed all the way back in 1922. You can imagine before the 1920s, it was like the Wild West out there for moving pictures. Surprisingly, there were some queer representation in pre-1920s film. Check out movies like Algie the Minor or Charlie Chaplin in A Woman. By the mid-1920s, various politicians, religious organizations, and even some pockets of the general public began to fight for full control of film subject matter. Some were enraged by the particular cinema being shown, while others knew that cinema would reach a huge audience and thus be the perfect way to deliver any biased message straight into an individual's mind. Not only was society not openly accepting of the gay community, but by the late 1920s, rigid censorship and rules were enacted to ensure quote-unquote acceptable morals on screen. So basically, biased small groups of studio executives and government-appointed politicians would review films and quite literally throw away or ban entire films from being shown. This is what we call the pre-coded and eventually the coded era of cinema, so it was from about 1927 to 1958. All that being said, there were loopholes around this. Some actors resorted to deducing their community down to stereotypes for comedic effect, while others slipped in queer coding. And here is where we get to today's episode subject. My team and I sifted through a list of films and compiled the top three examples of blatant LGBT plus movie scenes that somehow made it past those censorship laws. Film number one, it's called Wings and was released in 1927 and arguably shows the first homosexual kiss on screen for a film with dialogue. This film is a romantic war drama that follows two best friends who become Air Force pilots named Jack and David during World War I. It shows how they deal with the conflictive feelings of sharing the same girl as their love interest. The girl in question is named Sylvia, a wealthy, perfect American girl, played by silent film star Jabina Ralston. Her presence is pretty much to make the film progress, and she disappears at the beginning of the film and reappears at the end for a very brief scene. Also, Jack and David barely talk about her. It really feels like the female character was just there to create some excuse to see how their friendship evolved. This film also has star Clara Bow, you might have heard of her, playing the girl next door. She is the opposite to Sylvia, very loud, outgoing, passionate, and with what they would have then considered to be quote, male interests like cars and war. The twist that makes this film interesting and relevant to this episode is that the two pilots share a tender romantic kiss, one that many film historians consider the first gay kiss in film history. Adding to this, in more recent times, the whole film was reevaluated by film academics and diverse authors and recategorized as a queer coded film. By this point, you might be asking, what is a queer coded film? So in simpler words, queer coding is subtlety, implying the sexuality of a character without making it explicit. The difference between coding and baiting is that queer coding was used to avoid censorship while queer baiting is used to profit from the community without acknowledging them. So back to Wings. Callum Russell states in an article for Far Out Magazine that the term friendship was used to dodge censorship regulations and I believe social backlash as well. The author Kevin Sessoms reflected on the film saying, neither of them shows as much love for her, however, than they do for each other. So could it be that this film was a gay love story disguised to avoid the social consequences? Well, it could be, or maybe we're reaching, but I do believe that there is some gay subtext and I'm not saying this as proof of our theory, but more, I think the director was a little progressive in some ways. Because if you pay attention in one specific scene, you can see a lesbian couple sitting in a restaurant showing affection for each other outright. That's 100% confirmed. So now we move on to film number two. The industry became daring and daring with each attempt to swipe out the creative control from filmmakers and studios. 
We can imagine that during this period, the relations between the government, industry, and conservative groups were as tense as it could get. But it didn't stop the portrayals of queer characters. Actually, in 1933, these portrayals were at its peak. The next film I want to talk about is Queen Christina, starring Greta Garbo. This film is a fictionalized version of the real-life Queen Christina of Sweden. Queen Christina was born in the early 17th century as the only successor to the throne, and her father pushed to raise her like a boy, which later imprinted a lot on her personality and gender expression. She was even crowned as King of Sweden, not Queen of Sweden, after her father's death at the age of six. So the uncertainty about her gender and sexuality was part of the 1933 screen adaptation. The film tried to use these historical facts as much as possible. For example, throughout the movie, Greta's costume fluctuates from typical standard male clothing to female clothing, but the gender bending goes even further. There are multiple times in the film where Christina is perceived by others as male, something she never bothers to correct. Now this is a real fact that after leaving the monarchy, Christina left Sweden as a man and it's rumored that she lived as one for a while. This subject becomes blurry as the story keeps going. For example, at one point, when arguing with an advisor about marriage, her chancellor says, but your majesty, you cannot die an old maid, which she responds, I have no intention to chancellor, I shall die a bachelor. This line was supposed to be taken out of the final cut, but the director dismissed the motion picture association recommendation and left it. The movie also includes someone who is very important to the real Christina's life, her lady-in-waiting Ebba Spar, with whom she had an on-and-off relationship with until Ebba got married. It's addressed briefly in the film, but they did not leave much to speculate. The romantic kiss is quick, but it's there, right in front of the very eyes of the censors. But then the film moves on quickly from this scene, and the heterosexual love arc begins, and the lesbian love affair is just left unknown. We could complain about the clear straight washing here, but considering it was a film from 1933, made in the middle of a lot of pressure to censor all stories that didn't match Christian values, we can appreciate how everyone involved in this movie did what they could. In summary, we can say that Queen Christina is a genuine and just representation for its time of queer identity. And last, film number three, love this movie, The Sign of the Cross. In November 1932, Cecil B. DeMille released The Sign of the Cross. This film tells the story of the real life Emperor Nero of Rome and his wicked persecution of Christians in the year 66 AD. If there's one movie that can be blamed for the existence of the Hayes Code, this is it. The movie shows Christians getting tortured in horrible ways like getting eaten by lions or alligators, elephants stepping on them, gorillas assaulting girls. There is a scene with an ORGY where an exotic dancer performs a seductive dance called the Dance of the Naked Moon to one of the Christian girls. Once the film was sent for approval, it was most likely this dance and this scene as a whole that was going to be cut out and censored. But the studio relations committee gave the okay to the film with no demands at all. They understood that the sinful scene, such as the dance, was justified because it was shown as pagan ritual and historically accurate for the time. So therefore it was fine. But there were people who did not understand it in that way at all. Christian Resner, a Methodist Episcopal minister, was one of them. The author Cecilia Presley in her book Cecil B. DeMille, The Art of the Hollywood Epic, quotes the exact words of him. He attacked the film by saying, It is repellent and nauseating to every thinking Christian. She also quotes Father Lord, who declared, This film with its sadistic cruelty, its playing up of Roman lust and debauchery and crime, is intolerable. Jesuit America magazine called the dance the most unpleasant bit of footage ever passed by the Hollywood censors. Despite how amazing the existence of this film might feel, it does fall into the category of villainizing the LGBT plus people because it's not progressive or unexpected of those times. So in summary, the scene wasn't carefully crafted to create speculation, it was planned as what we might see a woman pleading for another woman's affection. It's important to remark that the person in charge of artistic direction was Mitchell Leeson, a very famous costume designer from back in the day. He was bisexual, and at the time of this movie, he was separated from his wife and living with his boyfriend, Eddie Anderson. This film, though, also has gay undertones that most people don't catch until more recent times. In Nero's portrayal, he's not only effeminate, but he sits around with nearly nude slave boys by his side and shares lusty looks with him throughout the film. 
It is believed that after this film was released to the general public in 1933, conservative groups had enough and they were determined to create a new film production code that would completely censor all these things out. In July 1934, they finally succeeded and after 14 years of attempts, the Hayes Code began to be rigidly enforced. These films show the Hollywood we could have had if the Hayes Code had never been implemented. The pre-code era was very rich in themes and representation, a time that was put on hold until the early 1960s. I hope you enjoyed this video and please don't forget to like and subscribe and always let us know in the comments below if you wanna see more things like this or different topics or anything in general and we'll get back to you.